Hey, folks, it's Lindsey Hollison with SPS back in the building. We got another chance to enjoy ourselves with the SPS Edge. And things may look a little different, but then again, they're all the same. I want to thank Terry McCord Jr. Uh, coming back from his vacation. I don't know if you were at, were you in Hawaii, Cancun, Puerto Rico. I know you took off on us for a minute, Terry. Glad <laughs> to have you back, man. I appreciate it, man. It's good to be back. Um, you know, the week felt a little too long. It felt like something was missing in my weekend. You know, come to find out this is what it was. The week wasn't the same. I'm glad to be back. Yeah, you was missing that SPS Edge Fist where you were missed, but yet and still, uh, we had the insiders holding us down, uh, both Patrick and John. And uh, John, is always great having you, but Patrick, I got to give you a public thanks. You did an awesome job. Uh, we weren't worried about positions changing, but we, we, we did make some uh, executive decisions. So the face you don't see, but you'll definitely hear, is our guy, Coach Orlando Watkins, who's going to kind of fall back a little bit. He got too much going on anyway because he's out here getting these great sponsorships for some great things he has going. Atlanta, you want to pop in for a second and tell us about some great things, some great organizations you work with, for example, uh, Bridgeport Industries. How you doing, man? Hey, how you doing, everybody? So I just want to give a shout out to uh, Bridgewater Interiors. We're going to give their logo. It's a little little muddy right, right now, but um, we've been slowly rolling out. We mentioned it and kind of teased it uh, early on, but uh, Team Michigan Sports, um, you know, Team Michigan is the very first a AU boys basketball program in the state of Michigan. Uh, we've kind of faded now. We probably more John can speak to it more than I can. Probably the most pros to ever come through an AAU program uh, mm -hmm. for sure in the state of Michigan, maybe the country. Uh, we're kind of making a comeback, uh, kind of getting things together. So what we're doing right now is that we did something just absolutely fantastic, and I've got to give. Uh, shout out to Ron Hall Jr. Uh, with Bridgewater Interiors, the CEO. If you sit down in your car, more than likely you're sitting in a Bridgewater Interior seat. Cadillacs, F-150 is fantastic. But we were, we're getting ready to announce, and we're going to slowly roll it. Next week, you'll see a whole lot more. We have signed a contract, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get excited. For six tournaments at Grand Traverse Resort. Give it up for Grand Traverse Resort. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely fantastic. That's good living up there, man. Right. Three-day weekend tournaments, state of play, everything that you need. You know, hope if the weather's good, you can go take your kids to the tournament, catch nine holes on one of their one of their fabulous golf okay. courses. Wonderful courses. Wonderful, Wonderful courses. courses. So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to be real quick because these guys have a lot of information for you, but our very first tournament will be holiday weekend. And we're going to call it Boosketball. Check out Boosketball.com. Halloween weekend. Halloween weekend. Boosketball is going to be a scary, good basketball tournament. I'm going to leave it to you guys. Hey, we appreciate you, Orlando. Orlando's been working so hard, man, uh, not only uh, on camera with us, you know, and uh, on the podcast, but behind the scenes. And we thank him for that. And uh, as a veteran and doing great things, he's been able just to fall back. Uh, John Trey uh, Spence says, hey, John. Uh, uh, and she said it with some hearts in the eyes. So, man, okay, you got some folks showing you love. Uh, Patrick looking at him like, who's that, man? <laughs> well, we're going to get to the show. Uh, without any further ado, we got a nice lineup for the time we have. It is draft night. It is finally here. Thursday, the NFL draft is here. Uh, you know, and say great to see him and Patrick in Orlando Walker. Thank you, Trey, for uh, popping in and saying hello. want to shout out my guys also, uh, the Streets of Talking Podcast Network, my guys. Uh, 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 Don Houston, the car man, as well as Clarence Babor representing. You want to show some love to the SWAC, folks. That's right, the state of Mississippi and all those great schools down in the SWAC. But we'll get started. I'll give you guys an overview of what we're going to touch on today. We're going to talk, talk about the NFL draft, obviously. Uh, we'll talk about the SWAC and some of the NFL draft players who are going to be up in there. Uh, also, uh, Devontae Smith, Smith, Heisman Trophy winner. Is he too small for the NFL? Some say yes. Some say no. Wanted to see what our esteemed panel has to say about that. My guy, Coach Mel Tucker over at Michigan State. Man, he is clean and house and upgrading. What Beyonce song with Jay-Z said, let me upgrade you. He's coming in on the upgrade tip for real. But I'll pose that same question with uh, my guy, Coach Tom Mizzo. Uh, is he clean and house? 
definitely he's cleaning the house, but is he upgrading? I think there's a difference. Also, one interesting thing about what uh, Coach Tucker is doing as well, he has a no trash talk rule, and I think that's pretty interesting. He said this guy needs to just focus on playing. I think that's an interesting dynamic when you have so many uh, teams that part of their culture is being hype and, you know, talking trash and all that. But uh, Coach Tucker said, no, nah, we don't get down like that, baby. And uh, finally, just want to put a question out there. Lakers and Nets, I'm not assuming that those are going to be the Western and Eastern Conference final champions, respectfully. But just right now, uh, both teams are seemingly unhealthy, whether it's the physical chem- – Orlando always on it, man. You don't have no job, Tommy from Martin. You always able to put <laughs> images up, man, you know. Uh, so it'll be something to see, and we'll talk about that. So without any further ado, I'll get to our guy who was out for a week uh, chilling on the beach, Terry. Terry, give us an overview of tonight's NFL draft and what you're thinking, and I'll defer to the insiders, both John and Patrick, to get their thoughts on it too. Man, right now I'm 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 tired and exhausted. You know, part of the reason is all this speculating of who's going number three. Uh, we kind of got a grasp on who's going one and two, but I mean, now Aaron Rodgers is talking about he doesn't want to play and doesn't want to return to the Packers because of some contract negotiation shenanigans going on. Man, it's a lot of drama. It's, it's every year the draft always brings some kind of drama, whether it's quarterback talk, whether who should be going number one, can this receiver really play? Or can this guy really give it? I mean, I'm, I'm ready just to see where guys fall and start speculating on how they would do on that team. Because I think there are a ton of good players in this draft, and I'm really excited to see where they land. Every team has their own culture. Every team has their own scheme. And I'm just happy to see a Najee Harris go to the Steelers as much as I hate the Steelers because I'm a Browns fan. But I would love to see that for him because I feel like that's that missing piece. He'll relish there. Guys like Devontae Smith. Uh, Micah Parsons probably going to the Browns, I hope, if he falls that deep because we were good last year. But it's a lot of players around that can really fall. Devontae Smith, Jamar Chase, ton of talent on the board. It's the first round today, but I I might watch the whole round. I might watch all the way through seven because there's so much talent. You don't know whose name is going to be called, and it's going to be a ton of fun, maybe some trades. But I'm just really excited for this to be over, but I'm really excited to see where guys fall. I love it. And one uh, statement I failed to mention as I bring Patrick and John in is that same old story on the black quarterback candidates. You know, you got Justin Fields and you wonder if some of the criticism he getting is valid or, or not. You know, you can look at, you know, a Mac Jones or somebody and uh, who got a DUI, but you don't hear anything about that, you know, but you hear all these other you know, potential character questions about someone like Justin Fields. And you wonder, is it justified or are we dealing in the age of that psychological aspect that you always have an issue with a black quarterback? Even Bill Bill Polian, who's a Hall of Fame GM, you know, once said that uh, Lamar Jackson, your guy, Terry, uh, should have been, you know, a receiver or, or, or been a DB. And that's the reason why he didn't even run the 40 at the combine because he knew it was going to be fast, but he didn't want to be put that. So I know we got a lot to talk about with the draft, but I defer to you, Patrick, and John to get your take on draft overall or even the other topic that I mentioned. Well, I, I first of all, Devontae Smith, uh, with the rules there are now, uh, playing defense, pass defense in the NFL. Once he gets off the line, I mean, come on. This this guy <laughs> did things that we haven't seen. Small, medium, large. They put him in situations where he's one-on-one. Now, is he going to be the guy in the slot that's going in and having two safeties come up and hit him? Well, that would be just useless to use him that way. So I don't think his size means anything. This, this 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 guy can run patterns and he can catch them. His double move is fast. Mm. And and I think he's going to be a terrific pro and as far as uh, a black quarterback, I I think that is absolutely somebody Bill Polian doesn't work anymore by the way. Okay? He doesn't have right. a job as a GM anymore. Thank goodness, because right. who the hell would want to watch Lamar Jackson play wide receiver when you can watch him play quarterback? You tell right. me when you see him play quarterback, <laughs> isn't that dynamic, and you just wait for the next play? Russell Wilson. I mean, do I have to go on and tell you the black quarterbacks that have succeeded and played well? I mean, come on. It's ridiculous. 
uh, listen, those guys want to, those owners want to make money and they want to win Super Bowls. Drunk driving, all this other crap, move it aside. Who's playing on Sunday? Who's winning on Sunday? That's what these guys care about. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, Justin Fields, sometimes he's a little high. You know, he gets he gets amped up a little bit early in a game, and he throws kind of high. But, God, you watch this guy play. He's big. He's strong. He's fast. He throws darts. This guy, this guy is as good a quarterback as is coming out this year. Now, whether he'll succeed or not in the NFL, I don't know. You can't guarantee me that Trevor Lawrence is going to succeed. I thought Sam Darnold was one of the best college passers I've seen in a while, and, and he's had a hard time. So nothing is in stone tonight. No player is guaranteed an all-pro position or, or, or starting job. NFL, not for long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Patrick, before I bring you in, I also want to recognize our great sponsors. I want to shout out to Horatio Williams Foundation. Shout out Horatio Williams himself. Shout out Gilead Sciences, as well as Dick Sporting Goods. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to share this great message. Uh, Patrick, I know you got some things you want to say about the NFL draft and the other topics, but I will pose a question that I know I can't pose to Terry. But this question is for Patrick because when it comes to Justin Fields, is there a fair criticism that he only played those eight games, if you will? And not even all eight, because I remember being at the Michigan State game uh, and they had you know a different thing going on, if you will. I can't remember. Did he play against Michigan State? Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the most, the most probably one of the best. That's I mean, right. That's right. I just know that they, uh, I yeah. just know half their team was out. But is also is that a fair criticism to say that they only had eight games compared to other? But Patrick, give us your take on the NFL draft and what's happening tonight, and uh, any other things that we talked about. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's fair at all. Um, you have you have players like last year, Joe Burrow only played one good season. The season before that, he was very mediocre. He had a very mediocre year at LSU. And then he had this stellar all-time great season, and he went number one. Uh, if everybody can't remember, in high school, they are in the same grade. These boys grew up 40 miles away from each other. They were always 1A and 1B, Trevor and it Lawrence. flip-flopped. Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields, they were always 1A and 1B. And I'm talking from the elite quarterback camps to, to everybody's opinion because – I guess because Trevor Lawrence picked Clemson and had that, you know, championship run his freshman year, maybe that separated the two a little bit. But the kid was dynamic at Ohio State. He had a phenomenal year. And there's been so many comments about Trevor Lawrence and other th and that nobody's talking about. I mean, his college coach and his dad said he could walk away from football right now and be happy. And uh, he, told, he told NFL in his NFL interviews, the Super Bowl is not end all be all for me, you know. So these are kind of uh, competitive kind of nature questions that he's kind of, you know, he. I don't know. Got to pass on it, huh? Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, um, and it's funny you say that because the knock on Justin Fields was that is he really passionate about football? Well, hell, he led the charge to return the football. He was the, the literally the face of college football, saying, "Let's get back to playing." During the pandemic, you know, right. so I just think that psychologically, man, I just think that we're still dealing with issues of race in America. Yeah. And what happens is even unknowingly, and that doesn't mean it's right, but people automatically get to this thing that when they see black, they're more likely to criticize. And when they see white, they're more likely to give a pass. It's almost like kids right. can be the same age, same situation, but you're going to be more critical. That's like when you look at the suspension rate in high school or in elementary schools. It's always much higher for young African American males compared to other races, but I think that's fair. But staying on the NFL draft, we could talk a little bit more. And shout out to the SWAC, shout out to our folks who are listening uh, in the great state of Mississippi and all throughout the SWAC. Uh, there are a number of players who are uh, being looked at uh, potentially tonight to go on the draft. Uh, I'm going to shout out some names, uh, and if you're listening, uh, feel free to uh, drop us a line. We welcome questions and comments. But you got a kill glass over at Alabama AM uh, at quarterback. Uh, uh, Ladarius Skelton, 
uh, quarterback at Southern. Uh, Felix uh, Harper, if I'm saying his, his name correctly, uh, he is over at uh, Alcorn State. Uh, also, you got um, – let me see. I want to get these names right. You got Devin Ben, who is a uh, running back at Southern. You got uh, uh, Donnie Corley, wide receiver coming out of Texas Southern. You know as well. You got uh, Zabarian Moore, uh, wide receiver out of Alabama A and M. Uh, you also have uh, Harry Ballard, wide receiver out of uh, University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. I'm looking to get some more names as well. You got Danny Garza. Uh, offensive lineman at Prairie View A&M, uh, as well as uh, Atandre Smith, offensive lineman at uh, University of Alabama, uh, excuse me, University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. Uh, and got a few more guys I want to make sure I got uh, on here. Oh, yeah, also uh, Spencer. Uh, what's Spencer's last name? Uh, Spencer Corey is a kicker out of Alabama A&M. So right there I named, you know, a, a dozen guys who may have the opportunity to go into the NFL coming out the swag. And I think it begs the question, you know, is it all about where you play or is it all about talent? And then I guess the other question, I'll start with our coach, uh, our, our longest tenured coach on the panel, uh, uh, John, you know, is it true that if you have talent, they will find you no matter where you are? So I'll defer to you, uh, your idea on the swag and these guys, and I'll go from uh, uh, Patrick, excuse me, from John to Patrick to Terry. What do you think, John? John? Well, I, I agree with what you just said, uh, that they'll find you. And, and when you watch an NFL game, you know, you're, you're always surprised to see some of the schools that these guys came from. Yeah, you're like, where is that school at? Where is yeah, that at? They're not, they're not the power five. So, you know, a little shout out and hopefully to, to my boy, Donnie Corley, who I love dearly and watched play in high school and have a lot of respect for what he's been through in his life. Uh, and, and I hope that his night is, is good. His next couple days, I know he's going to get a shot and he's going to show it, but these guys are, are going to be able to get a shot, but I want to add one thing before I turn it over to Pat. Please do. Please do. Nick Saban always told me, he said, John, when you're in a draft room, when you're in a meetings of who you're going to draft, the number one topic is negative things of why I shouldn't draft this guy. Not the positive things he can do. The negative. What? Give me a reason why I shouldn't draft him. He said, and that's the mindset of an NFL draft room. Because I guess everyone has talent, right? Right on time. But everyone has talent, so let's get down to the common denominator of what may be problematic. Right, right. And do you think that those scouts and those GMs, when they're in there, do they have a high tolerance for pain, or should I say, a high tolerance for 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 BS? You know, meaning that hey, kid got a DUI, kid may have a, a DV, domestic violence, a kid may have. You know some issues with you know stealing beer or something like that. Do you think they have a higher tolerance for that? Well, I think that they're more aware of that today than ever. And but then again, we're going to come back to the level of what they think this young man can play like, and they're going to say, "Well, you know what? He had a domestic violence when he was 19. So you know what?" We're going to put him in some counseling and we're going to address this thing and we're going to take care of it. And by the way, make sure you're in the weight room and make sure you're getting ready to play because <laughs> on sense. Sunday is what, what counts. They're, they're going to have some kind of public relations stuff available for every shortcoming if that player is valued enough for how he competes on the field. I get it. I get it. I get it. Pat, uh, J Patrick, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I agree. With, I agree with my dad. It's it's um the the technology and everything that's going on now. It's uh you're if you can play, they will find you. You know, I've I've uh that was one of the things that impressed me the most. Um, when uh me and my dad used to go walk around at Michigan State, and they have they have a whole staff that just break down videos all day long before they even get to uh 
Coach Tucker or, or even in basketball, Izzo. Like, there's there's so much tape on these guys now. And I think that as long as you're good enough, I think you'll get a shot. Wow. Wow. I like that. Terry, what's your take on what we got going on right now? I mean, I will honestly say that uh, the biggest thing, you know, to, to answer the question, I would probably say it's not whether if, whether or not they'll find you. I think we just have to overcome the bias, uh, the biases that come with it. I mean, a lot of times guys are being – um, overlooked because of the level of ball they play at. I mean, guys are, I mean, let's just face it. Guys aren't going to take swag ball serious compared to SEC or Big Ten, maybe even mid-majors. I mean, they're not going to take it serious. FCS, we hear with Trey Lance all the time. I mean, right. guys just aren't going to, it's, it's just a bias that we're going to hear and say every year. I mean, we heard it with Carson Lentz. We heard it with a lot of guys, you know, we're like, you know, well, can he play? I mean, he didn't really play anybody. You know, you hear that with Gonzaga. You heard that, you know, it doesn't matter what sport. There's always going to be some kind of bias of competition level. But I think, you know, I think that, that that's what makes scouting teams so great, that they bypass what the competition level is, and they can evaluate overall skill. Like, can this guy fit in what I'm trying to do? And I think you see that with AAU and college recruiting. I mean, you go in there to an AAU game, this kid may not score all the points, but can he do that one thing that I need him to do? Can he fit my scheme? Can he can he play under me? I mean, I know a story where Bob Huggins uh, at West Virginia, Huggy uh, Bear, where he uh, he recruited Javon Carter, and Coach Jones told us all the time his little speech that get us to play defense all the time. He was like, man, he went to go recruit Javon Carter, and, and he recruited him because he played full court defense the whole game, hard full court defense. And he said, no, nah, he was there to see somebody else. But he said, no, nah, I want I want to know who that kid is. And that kid's playing in the NBA today. So, I mean, it just goes to show it does not matter what level. If you can fit what that coach needs and you can and you can relish in that role. I mean, you, there's going to be a spot for you here in the NBC when they got the Sunday night football games. You hear all kinds of schools listed, you know, that you may not even heard of. You got to do a little quick Google search. Maybe it might be in in Texas or somewhere in Washington. Players that are good and fit that team scheme, they're going to have a spot for you. Yeah. Terry's on it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well said. Well said. Well, you kind of touched on it earlier, Patrick, when you talked about Michigan State. And I know, uh, John, you're a fan of uh, Mel Tucker just as I am. And I tell you what, uh, I'm fortunate to have a relationship with him and to be able to be in you know, constant communication, man. But he had so much going on. Every time I looked at the paper, it was like another kid was hitting the portal. You know what I'm saying? It was hitting the portal, hitting the portal. But in the same breath, just as you see kids hitting the portal, you see all these top players coming in from Purdue, from Tennessee, from all over. Just top-notch players with this experience all wanting to be here. So I pose the question, you know, uh, you see Coach Tucker cleaning house, uh, you know, uh, and I saw one of the headlines in the story by my guy Chris Solari. Chris Solari is a writer for the Free Press. He covers Michigan State football and uh michigan state uh basketball he said you know people got to get used to it so john do you think the michigan state faithful are going to get used to coach tucker uh clean the house the way he is and pretty much saying you know and coach tucker won't say this i know but pretty much saying coach d's last you know uh recruits weren't really up to snuff and i gotta bring some some high level players in here what do you think about that john there's no doubt about it. The cupboard was was bare. Very, very little talent left for him to take over. 26 players have entered the transfer portal since Coach Tucker took over. Woo! <laughs> and 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 but with this one year deal, hmm. if you if you played the spring and your third or fourth string. You're going to leave. I don't care whether you're at Michigan State or where you're at. Yeah. You're going to look yeah. for a place to play. Didn't we just see that? Which quarterback just left? Just announced the portal recently? Theo uh, Day. Yep, yeah, Theo Day. He said, I'm out, cuz. <laughs> right. Right. Because he's fifth. Okay. And he's never going to see the field and he's going to hold a clipboard. So he wants to play. So, but here, I, 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 I thought that naturally, the number one position that he needed to address was quarterback. He needed a better offensive line, and he needed a better secondary. 
So mm -hmm. what does he do? His linebackers are wiped out. Okay. So he goes and gets Kuveris Crouch from Tennessee, who was a top 60 player in ESPN's ranking. He last year he had, I believe, 11 solo tackles against Alabama. He played mm -hmm. outside as a freshman. He played inside as a sophomore. He's 6'2", 235. He got a Ben Summerin from Michigan, and he got Itavian Brown from Minnesota, and then he's got a four-star Maya Gail Tate coming from Bishop Gorman. So he's taking care of the linebacker, and he got he got a Chester Kimbrough from Florida. He's got a young kid named Charles Brantley is going to be a freshman out of Florida. He got another transfer, Kendall Brooks. Uh, they say Darius Snow was made. So he's upgraded in some things that he needed. He got got a, one offensive lineman that started last uh, Saturday from Arkansas State. And so he's upgrading. He's upgrading what he's going to put on the field. And the important thing here, and I'll turn it over to Terry or Patrick, he's not done yet. Yeah. He's not done yet. He's going to add some more people before the fall. All right, I know that's the case. But before we go to Patrick and then Terry, let me ask you this question too, John. What is it about Mel Tucker that makes him a draw? I mean, I know he's an awesome recruiter, but what is it that you keep seeing these, you know, high-level players, you know, from Duke, from, from Purdue, from uh, Tennessee – making their way to East Lansing. What is it about him that has these guys making that change? Well, just, just think about it, okay? He he goes up and plays high school football in Cleveland. At that time, a hotbed. He gets recruited out of high school, and he's in Barry Alvarez. Barry Alvarez, a great football coach. He's in his first recruiting class at Wisconsin. He plays, Okay. He takes his try. He comes back and he coaches. Look at where he's been. He's on, he's a graduate assistant at Michigan State. Look where this guy's been. Look who he's been around. Look at the names he's been around. The guys that he's been an assistant coach under. Jim Tressel, Nick Saban, Kirby Smart. He coaches in the NFL. He takes two stints to the NFL. <laughs> this guy is a football guy, a genuine guy who loves the game. Now, put that together with his character as a human being, his understanding of what these young men are trying to accomplish and where they're trying to get to. And I believe that he cares about them not only as football players, but it's about human beings, mm -hmm. about getting it. He understands the value of an education. He understands and hopes and helps and, and prides himself on people around him being successful. This whole package, Michigan State is very, very fortunate to have a man with this kind of character and this kind of pedigree in football to be running their program. I'm yeah, right. They've had two home runs in a row. Mark D'Antonio was pretty damn good too until yeah. the time came up. Yeah. And then you add $32 million in uh, infrastructure investments that they're going to get, and they go spread that around. Patrick, uh, yeah. what do you think about the clean house and the upgrade that uh, Coach Tucker has going on right now? I love it. And um, – and it's, a, it's one of the main, main reasons why I love this transfer portal because now it doesn't take a coach two to three years to get their guys in there. Good point. You know, it, it's an accelerated process. So with his pedigree and, and his background, him getting his guys in there is going to show an immediate – you're going to get an immediate results from that. And I love it. I love it. I'm sure. Uh, Terry, what you got? I know this is not, uh, you know, Scarlet and Gray. I know this is not your guys uh, in Columbus, but what you think about 
uh, Mel Tucker's uh, house cleaning and upgrading? Well, I mean, I, I think I think with uh, with Coach Tucker, he's bringing a, a sense of uh, a standard. I mean, mm -hmm. I think one thing that's drawn a lot of guys in is the new facilities that's being brought in. Um, I know something that Coach Tucker. I mean, he's been around some NFL guys. He knows a lot of people. I mean, like, like you mentioned, the guys that he's coached underneath. I mean, he knows a lot of names. That definitely does help your cause. Um, for him, I think a lot of guys see a chance of opportunity. I mean, Coach Tucker made it known that if you can play ball and you can play under my scheme here, there will be a spot here for you. And so I think that kind of draws some attention to a transfer because, I mean, at the end of the day, you mentioned like, like Theo Day, he's transferring to go somewhere where he thinks he can play. These guys coming in, they believe they can play at MSU and they believe that they can uh, withstand through Coach Tucker's pressure to play at your best game. Here and that all and, and and that brings a fire underneath the players that are returning. They're like, oh man, these guys are here, like 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 Peyton Thorne. There, there, there's a fire under his butt right now because he's like, man, this dude Russo, Anthony Russo's coming in, thinking that he just has a spot transferring. No, this is my spot. Yeah. I spot ended the year as the quarterback of MSU. <laughs> so now yeah. I mean that they bring some fire and competition. And a lot of times that I mean competition always brings the best out of players. It's either going to make you or break you. And I think that's something that um, these MSU players coming in and, and those that are transferring in, you know, those that think they have what it takes, some of them may not. Some of them may like, oh, I came to the wrong spot. I mean, it's, it's a little, it's too much. <laughs> but and others may be like, yep, this is exactly what I want. I want to come here. I want to grind under this new culture. Coach Tucker wants to turn things around. I'm all for that. Let's get going. And so I think that it's a great opportunity for him to kind of take bits and pieces of guys who are trying to make a new name for themselves as he, as he tries to make a new name for Michigan State. Yeah, you're right. And I think someone, you know, to the guy's point, you know, uh, Coach Tucker is definitely benefiting from the portal because it definitely works with his, you know, recruiting style. So we'll see. So going across the street, if you will, uh, from Spartan <laughs> Stadium over to the Breslin Center, you know, we got some portal action going on with your guy, Tom Izzo. John, but you know, I, I, we don't see the upgrades right now. You know, we saw you know the outstanding uh point guard coming in, but for the most part, you got two open scholarships. Uh, you had pretty much minimum change in the coaching staff with Dane Fife heading down, and I think we all know he's gonna be the coach in waiting at University of Indiana. Happy for my guy Dane, but you know, you just don't see anything, any kind of movement that is consistent with Michigan State making a splash. So, John, I'll start with you. What do you think about not only the cleaning house that's taking place with Coach Izzo's basketball team, but the question mark behind the word upgrade? Well, did you see the interview with Tom Izzo at the spring football game? Briefly, with him and Coach D'Antonio were talking to Darren Harris. Darren Harris, yes. Okay. Uh, Izzo said something that kind of pissed me off. And he, and he was referring to how many transfers uh, mm -hmm. Coach Tucker's bringing in. And uh -huh. he said, well, you know, and he's not even done yet. You know, and he said it. I, I didn't like the way he said it. it. He said it like he didn't appreciate this. He didn't hmm. appreciate the transfer. Oh, he like, like, like he ain't even done yet. Like there's more to it to go. You know, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I don't think he has a problem with Coach Tucker. I think he's got a problem with the transfer portal. and Because uh, he's not know, benefiting from it, probably, because he, well, he ain't able to know, work it like that. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're asking a horse to learn a new trick now, right. okay? And, and you know, he's got the, got the one kid in, Walker, from Northeastern, and – and he's supposed to be, if you if you follow this stuff, he's one of the leading transfers, but he hasn't got anybody else. He's lost out on some big kids. To me, he needs someone who's going to compete with Gabe Brown, and he needs a rim protector, okay? He's going to have to play Walker and Jade Atkins, and he's going to have Christy, uh uh, playing at the two, who is a very high level. Needs a couple more guys to have 
But then those are, those are freshmen you're talking about. You're kind of throwing the weight of everything on a freshman. To indeed, he's highly touted, but come on, man. Freshman transition is real. You know, he hasn't – He, you would think at this point that you would hear more about a couple guys. He missed out on some guys already that I don't understand why he wasn't on them. But I don't think he likes this. And I don't think he – I think he's a stubborn guy. And, yeah. and I don't know if he's going to benefit. You know, Lindsay, when the three-point shot first came out, the old guard didn't see it coming. Rick Pitino was a young guy. He saw it coming, and he built a team around it. A, a no-name team from Providence ends up going to the Final Four shooting threes and after one year they all said holy shit i better learn how to, <laughs> I better yeah. Learn how to do this and, yeah you know, and so they they well, that, was, that was bear Bryant of alabama saying i gotta get me one of those when they talk about well, the black players I, coming i up. mean you right. know that's why he brought john mckay in to beat his ass okay yeah. to show all those guys that gave money that this is what you need to win and tom is you know I don't know if he's ever going to get it. I, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I've been following some things. You know, there's a war right now between Kentucky and Illinois over these two assistants. These two assistants that John Calipari wants one back who used to be with them and then took the head job at South Florida, got fired, and yep, ended up yep. in Illinois, is an AAU guy from the legendary New York City Gauchos. The other mm. assistant in Illinois is the, what's the name of the team out of Chicago? The Mac Irvin Fire. Mac Irvin Fire. Yeah, we know about Mac Irvin Fire. Okay. So, so Brad Underwood's got two guys sitting next to him that come from AAU roots. And that's how he mm. got the sumo, and that's how he got Big Coburn, okay? So mm. now Tom Izzo gets somebody who's been working with him at 54 years old and is a retread instead of going out and getting somebody who can bring some players in here and get him some new ideas in a burst of energy. So I have no confidence in Tom Izzo taking advantage of what the NCAA rules are, what's afforded a coach, and I, and, and I, I don't think he's ready to take advantage of it. Because he's too damn stubborn. Patrick, I, I want to get your take on it, but I'll throw this question to you and to Terry as well. And I guess on a scale of 1 to 10, because I got to feel it had some impact, how much of a role do you think the Gabe Brown incident, i.e. Aaron Henry 2.0, may play in the fact that people are not just excited to come play for Tom Izzo if they have to worry about potentially getting cussed out on national TV and all these other factors when you just don't see that anywhere else in that type of pla on that type of platform and secondly uh you don't have the wins to go with it because it's not like he was getting cussed out of halftime in the championship game before they cut down the nets at the end of the game follow what i'm saying so i just want to put it out there as a potential question for you and terry both as you give us your take on uh the lack of upgrades that we're seeing with uh coach izzo's program right now yeah and i'm, I'm going to use a word that i i hate saying because i don't want people to think that I'm a young person hating on the old guy, but it, if you don't like the transfer portal, it screams dinosaur to me. You are a wow. dinosaur. It screams yeah. it to me, and I hate to use that word, but it's <laughs> not true. It's so true. Why would you not want access to more players? Like it makes no sense to me. And then, no. But the flip side it, of it is, if I could add, Patrick, it's not that before Izzo. It's not that you have, but it gives the players. Autonomy. And that's it. And he's coming right. from an era where it was iron fist. Right. And now it's like, man, you right. mean to tell me they got to say, but I don't want to cut you off. But I think that's the dynamic we see with uh, Coach Izzo. Right. And then also you have you have the the coach that kind of kind of um, lies to you a little bit and gets you in there. You see something totally different. Now this kid has a chance to leave. You know, so yes, my old playbook it, don't work. That old, that old stuff coaching, don't work. It affects him on both ends. But, you know, 
his for for my my entire life I've been watching Izzo. He he puts leashes on guys. You know, I thought Keith Applin was better than what where he what he played at Michigan State. Sure. Um, I thought at times I thought at times Caleb <laughs> Lucas was better than than what he played at Michigan State and Darrell Summers and Chris Allen and mm. some. Times he holds 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 those guys back. So, does it affect his recruiting? Yes, I think it's been affecting him because for so many years in a row, me and my dad we say, "Man, he's one guy away, one guy away." You know that team with Miles Bridges and um, the big boy from Memphis. Oh, uh, Jaron Jackson. I mean, they were they were one player away, man. They were one player away, and. You know, it it's 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 sad to me because it's my favorite place in the world, and it seems like he's going out at the same way as as uh, Coach D'Antonio. I think there's mm -hmm. too much loyalty with his own with his own staff because it's like it's like my dad just mentioned with with the Mac Irvin Fire guys and the Gauchos guys. Where is yours? Where is yours? Why? Where is your young boy that's going to get twenty? That's going. He's got. 20 McDonald's All Americans in his phone in his context. You know, yeah. and DJ let, can only do so much, and Dane is gone. Exactly. You know? So, you know, and, and I mean, you know, and and for and for his point, uh, Dane, I mean, he brought he's the one who brought Kithier and uh he's the one who brought Kithier and Foster. You know, yeah. what they do to help the team. <laughs> oh, good point. So, like, even you what you what brought, I mean? that was I, it. I mean, we've had we got teams. We like the two. I was so impressed by those two young guards at Purdue. Every time mm -hmm. I saw him play, I'd say, "Where is ours? Like, what what's going on with Michigan State?" You know, and it just it just proves my point. You know, you're a dinosaur, and sometimes those guys that's their identity, and that's all they are. So they want to keep coaching, but if you're not going to do it at a high level, it's it's really time to move on. Yeah. Terry, before I bring you in, I want to remind our, our listeners, uh, team to shout out the Streets of Talking Podcast Network with Don Houston, Carman, that is, as well as Clarence Babor. Uh, also to the Horatio Williams Foundation, uh, Dick Sporting Good, and Gilead Sciences. We really appreciate them. And to Patrick's point, you know, uh, Tom Mizzo has been able to get his, you know, championship, which is a hard thing to come by. And, and many people don't have it. And he got his championship. Uh, having a certain coaching style during a certain era, but you wonder if, like, you know, we used to we used to go to Blockbuster Video on Friday night. You know, what I'm saying to get you know to get the <laughs> videos, you know, the DVDs and whatever, whatnot, and uh, go do it. And uh, now we just do it from the comfort of our home. So, you, my point being is, has that window overlap? And I think we may be seeing it. And before I get to you, Terry, what I really think is going on, I think that Tom gets that. And even when you saw him outside with him and Coach D, the imagery was kind of stark too, John. I don't know if you kind of picked up on that. It was like they looked like some old men. And I and I say that with all due respect, but you didn't see the vibrancy of what it, what it was contrast against like this, like the, this is the future. Like you got one retired coach. Mm -hmm. and almost, it was like you was going to have two retired coaches right there. And I got number love for Tom Izzo. He has uh, played a you know significant role in my growth and development, and he knows he's my guy. But I think what he's doing is he's setting himself up for his swan song. Let me get my guys in place. Let me let, get my guys to have these titles so that when I transition that they got this. Let me set myself up for this new role they're going to create for me in the athletic department, uh, you know, athletic director of council or something like this so he can go out and do that. But you're right, man. There's no way in the world you're going to see – uh, Mel Tucker, with all this, you know, uh, 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 how should I say, high end, fast moving, progressive coaching going on. And then you look across the street and things are stuck. So, Terry, I didn't want to take too much of your time, but please give me your take on uh, the Tom Izzo upgrade or lack thereof. I would say that, um, I, I would say it's kind of an upgrade, but I would say in the sense of like, you really can't get much worse than what last year was in MSU uh in MSU sport basketball wise um i would say it's not really much of an upgrade we got a ton of talent coming in but they're they're, they're freshmen so i mean you really don't know what you're going to get you don't know how well they're going to blend in so it may not seem like an upgrade at first but in our reality i think it will become an upgrade um 
the whole thing about Izzo not really adapting to the game, it, it just kind of brings me to a sense of like, one, his stubbornness, and then his, his, his you know, he refuses to adapt to the game at all. And I, and I agree the whole dinosaur thing. Uh, it, it's interesting how you came up with that one. But I mean, the whole thing is just that Izzo is going to hurt him with recruits. I, I've said this on the show a lot of times, it's going to hurt him. But I think a lot of it has to do with guys now realizing that they can't get through to him. And, and, and they're not going to go there, waste a year, waste their time and try to see, well, maybe I can show Izzo if I can score. Maybe he'll he'll uh, take the leash off a little bit. No, it's not happening. Like, Izzo, Izzo has shown these last couple of years, you know, with Rocket, you know, Cassius has had a long leash because Cassius is who Cassius was. But players in the past, like, that that leash, man, it, 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 it's a leash. It, it's there. And, and a lot of times it's, it's very short for most. It may be medium because you could play and hit some crazy shots like Travis Trice would. But at the same time, it's like there's no getting through to Izzo to really change his ways. And players are seeing that and players are refusing to deal with that. So they are like, I'm going to go somewhere where a guy will listen to me and try to adapt to my play style, which I think coaches should do anyway. It's not – basketball is more as a – as I would say basketball is more as a player adapting the – Coaches adapting to players as players adapting to coaches just because basketball is such a dynamic game where you get so many different kinds of players that coaches have to try to put their players in the best situation. But there's just no getting in. There's no getting to him. He's not going to listen. And players are just going to find the best situation for them, whether it means to transfer or find a different school. Yeah. You make me immediately think about uh, the coach uh, that Juwan Howard succeeded referring to Coach Beeline. When he kind of just threw his hand up a couple seasons ago and said, look, man, I can't deal with this, all this stuff that's going on. It's like he saw the writing on the wall, and then you see him transition to the NBA. And basically, he got ran out the NBA for being on that old school, uh, you know, borderline inappropriateness with the things he was saying. So it's like, where do you go? Uh, and it's just tough because these guys have had their way for so long, but now things are changing. So speaking of NBA, what a perfect transition as we uh, wrap up, uh, you know, the remainder of the time that we have. You know, I posed a question earlier, uh, Lakers or Nets? And I'm not just assuming that, you know, these are going to be their Eastern and Western Conference final, you know, uh, matchups, if you will. But, you know, right now, you know, it's, it's a little drama going on in Brooklyn right now. You know, uh, I just really find it hard, and I'll start with uh, John and go to Patrick and finish with Terry. I find it hard that all of a sudden, you know, this super team that they put together is just going to come together and get through a playoff series, particularly, you know, uh, you know, to the Eastern Conference Finals and just win a championship when they really haven't shown, you know, anybody at work. They haven't shown anything so that they can come together and play. And the flip side of it is, you know, uh, same thing with the Lakers. They're working their way back in. You know, I'm sure LeBron has a date circle on his calendar when that cryo chamber he has, that little healing chamber he got at his crib is go, you know, push the button to have him set and he'll be ready to play. But I, I defer to you, John. Like, what do you think about uh, Lakers or Nets? Are we even talking about the potential Eastern and, we and Western Conference Finals and, and, and what's going on with that chemistry with them guys not all being healthy right now? Well, I, I think you, you have – kind of a unique year too. You're 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 coming off a year where they played late and there's been a there's been everything in everybody's lives has has been some kind of drama with this pandemic. And and I think that if those guys get healthy, if they're healthy, it, 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 if the Lakers get healthy they're going to be a tough out. You, you're going to have to beat them four times, okay? <laughs> and, and, and you know, be careful what you wish for, all right? And the same thing goes with Brooklyn. Uh, you know, you, you hear some stuff about Kyrie Irving, and, a, and you just hope that that this young man is, is feeling good about himself, and you hear all this different BS every day, you know? And I, I just want him to be at peak performance when it comes time to win. And Kevin Durant, I like to see the best players at their best playing against each other in the playoffs 
because it's exciting, different basketball than the regular season. It's different than the NCAA. It, it, it's grown men out here, the best basketball players in the world. And I just hope that they're able to perform at their best, that, 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 that they're feeling good and let the chips fall where they may. But I'm going to tell you what, be careful what you wish for because if both these teams are healthy, good luck beating them four times. Yeah, you're right. Before I go to Patrick, and maybe this is a question, John, that you can come back to us next week on, what is Vegas saying about these two teams? Or what is Vegas saying about the NBA Finals? Or is it too far out to say? No, they have, you know, they have odds right now. They they change those things every day. You can bet on a, a team to win it all. But the, the real lines won't come out until we know who's playing who. And, and 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 what who's got the home court advantage and then who's healthy and who's not. Yeah, I get it. We'll keep an eye out for that. Patrick, what's your take? Lakers and Nets, what's up? All this to beat this. Ha <laughs> ha, I like that. For our viewers who can't see what Orlando put up, man, he put up uh Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and James Harden. Then he put up against Alex Caruso. He said, all of this to beat this. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What you thinking, Patrick? Um I'm I'm agreeing with my dad. It it matters on how healthy they are. Uh, you know, I I've been really impressed with the 76ers this year. Yep. Shout uh, out to 76ers. Joel how much credit is- do you give to Doc Rivers on that? Glenn Rivers on that. Same team. 50-50. Okay. Okay. Because I think I think that um he has he has uh a track record with success. So when he comes in, it's not going to be like maybe like a Steve Nash type situation or something. I think the players immediately buy in and immediately mm. say, okay, I trust this guy. He's been here. Yeah. Immediate um, street cred, yeah. Yeah. And 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 I think that, you know, I, I truly am, am one to believe that Joel Embiid crying at the end of the game when, when uh, Kawhi hit that mm. shot, I don't think he wants it to happen again. And I think he up. I think he leveled up himself. And then you got the other. Hey, system. hey! But the Buffalo Bills didn't want to lose in the Super Bowl four times either. But it's still <laughs> you're, right. <laughs> you're right. It doesn't always transition to the win. But I think his mentality is a little tougher. I think he's playing. He grew up a little at a bit higher level than he has in the past. And you know what? He ain't chirping as much. I, I, right. I, I, didn't, even, I, I didn't even think about it till now. I mean, he was just chirping like he had it done. But he don't even chirp no more. Right. And, and 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 let's think about it. The team got better. You got yep. Danny Green who could, who could play defense on the wing at a high level and shoot the ball at a high level. Tobias mm-hmm. Harris is one of the better scorers. Yeah, just Harris don't be in the game game. six expecting him to hit a three-pointer and win a championship anyway. I'm sorry. I digress. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right. Ben Simmons, you know, I just, um, you know, James Harden played more time with the Rockets than he has with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving still. And we got less than a month left. And, you know, it's a lot to pull together, man. It's a lot to ask those guys to just automatically come back and just be at this NBA championship level team, which neither one of them individually has been able to accomplish on their own. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kyrie Irving, uh, he's, he's never made the playoffs without LeBron. And then last Ooh. when he was hurt two years ago in Brooklyn, they were better without him. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's just a lot to ask. Now, for the Lakers, on the other hand, LeBron James is the best basketball player in the world. Uh, this is the most time he's ever spent out. He's never spent this much time out, you know, besides that growing, you know. But um, he's he's a guy that the rust comes off very fast. And I think, I think the Lakers are the team to beat in the Western Conference because okay. everybody else is hurt. Look at look at because of the condensed season and playing so late. Look at all these hamstrings that are gone. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah. It's countless. The Joker Nicole Jokic is going to walk away with the MVP this year, and because it ain't of because it. of his stats. It ain't because <laughs> of how he played. Because he's the last man standing. Right, right, you know? right. We got uh, Orlando over here with the comic review <laughs> going on too. <laughs> yeah, you feeling good? Hey, that's what happened. Hey, he don't got to worry about speaking. He can just line them up. But no, right. I get what you're saying, though. You're saying yeah. that despite everything that's going on, uh, you still lean toward the Lake Show uh, to get it done. Yeah, yeah I think that's I'm, good money. I'm, yeah, I'm, yep. So 
I'm I'm go with, what's what's up with Terry over there? Terry, uh, you can be the one to give us the final comments with the time that we have, so you can bring us on home. What you thinking about uh, Brooklyn and L.A.? I mean, right now, I mean, the NBA right now feels like a like a reality TV show. I mean, it's always like something going on. You got you got the Knicks playing great basketball. The NBA is always at a, a all time high when the Knicks are good. So, I mean, you got you got the Knicks playing great. You got, you know, Brooklyn here and there, Kevin Durant, some some sideline story that has nothing to do with playing basketball is coming out. Uh, you got the Lakers healing up a little bit. I, I think LeBron's taking his sweet time right now to get back and going. They're kind of struggling a little bit. AD has been out for a while. I think people don't realize Anthony Davis had an injury where he had to sit down. Like he's not like moving around like how LaMelo is right now with him just being his hand or, you know, having like, like a, a upper body injury. With that calf and Achilles, you can't do too much moving. I mean, are you going to re-aggravate it? You got to sit you down. Tell Who you tell him? I'm sitting <laughs> over here with my leg propped up right now. Well, go ahead. So, I mean, AD, AD would be the one to tell you, like, man, you, you can't really do anything. And, and so I think with that, I think you got to give the son some credit with Chris Paul and what he's been oh, doing. Yeah. I got him as maybe a dark, a dark, a dark horse, excuse me, top three MVP uh, in uh, MVP race. Um Portland can always sneak up on you. They got some defensive struggles right now. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, the Lakers are always going to be who they are. I mean, we've seen this time and time again. LeBron, where things just don't seem right, always turning up being just okay is what I like to say. I mean, things, oh, they're hurt right now. We don't really know this team, that team. LeBron James is going to find a way to get it done. Um, and in the East, man, it could really be a toss-up. But I think like what John was saying, if Kyrie, Harden, and KD, you know, when they were all playing together, um, you know, at one point, you know, their offensive rating was through the roof. I just don't really see a team that can really keep up with that other than uh, but, uh, and unless you're slowing them down, which the Sixers did really well at playing against them. So, or you, you, they, we may not see that Philly in that series if Philly gets knocked off by, let's say, the Bucks or – Maybe the Knicks give them a run. You never know in the East. I think it's fun to see the Eastern Conference kind of getting back up to those those teams that have that have historically done well in the NBA and their fan base is going crazy. So it's going to be an interesting playoffs. I think right now it, it's it's at a it's at a point where it's like it's at a uh, it's kind of plateaued a little bit. Like we kind of see the teams that are going to be in the playoffs, but we're interested in seeing those matchups happen and playing you know, at most seven times in a series. Like, imagine seeing the Suns and the Jazz both healthy seven times almost. Seven times. Both teams play hard. Like, it, it's going to be a great NBA playoff season. I can't wait for it. Yeah, it's going to be some good stuff to watch. Well, guys, as always, you put together a great show, and I appreciate it. I like our new format. Uh, we've given uh, Orlando too much free time. He got the comedy uh, review going all the time. We appreciate that, Orlando, and all that you're doing. Also, I uh, wanted to give another shout out to Bridgewater Interiors for supporting Boosca Ball and what's going to be happening as well. Patrick, we want to formally welcome you uh, to the platform as Orlando has uh, taken on a new role. And Terry, we want to welcome you back. And John, uh, you continue to bring the spice. Uh, to our listeners out there, Aaron Mays, uh, Stephen Smith, and our faithful listeners, we appreciate you guys supporting the show. So with that, I'll say my final goodbyes and thank you to our sponsors, uh, the Horatio Williams Foundation. Uh, Gilead Science, as well as uh, Dick Sporting Good, uh, and finally uh, to uh, the Streets of Talking Podcast Network, Don Houston and Clarence Babor, and lo much love to the SWAC, 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 SWAC. All right, guys, we'll see you That's next swag. time. Thanks for joining, and uh, catch up uh, in a week. Bye.